Good morning, dear Walfus Bay Baptist Church, and it's wonderful to be with you this morning again as we indulge ourselves in God's Word. Before we, we do that, I have a few announcements. I hope you have received the bulletin, so I'm going to draw your attention to a few things on the bulletin. First, firstly, next Sunday, Pastor Cully will be back preaching from Psalm 73, and the title of that sermon will be the truth about temptation. Also take note of our prayer requests. Thank the Lord for answered prayer. Thank the Lord for a new baby boy who was born um, for Thomas and Sharon Huber. Um, continue to pray for our situation in, in our country with regard to COVID. Please pray for them when you family. Um, they have lost their beloved mother and um, that the Lord will comfort them in this time of sadness for them. Pray for our theological students. Pray for those who are ministering in other places. Pray for our medical staff working in the hospitals and other places. Pray for our family and friends and, and specifically for their salvation. Um, pray for Uncle Klaus Kantak, Emilio de Gouveia, the Sparks, Marcel Offer, Tala Angolo, and John Shelley, who are either very sick at the moment or they are recovering from, um, from uh, COVID or some other related health issues. Well, with that said, I also need to um, just remind you that uh, our Sunday school, young people, ladies' Bible study, men's evening um, are not meeting in person at the moment due to the COVID regulations but there, there is some material available for Sunday, for the Sunday school, for the young people and the ladies I know. Then a very important announcement for all the, for the elders and the deacons. We have a, an elders and deacons meeting this Thursday, 29th of July at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Well, we're here because we love our Lord Jesus we here because we want to hear what he has to say to us in his word. So please turn with me to the second chapter in the letter of James. James 2, and I'm going to read from verse 1 up to verse 13. James 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles just at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So far the reading of God's word. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, that we have your clear word especially with regard to how we should love one another, how we should relate to each other. Lord, I pray that this morning you will 
once again direct us in this matter, touch our hearts, um, touch our thinking, Lord, that we can start to act in a way that imitates Christ. Help us to see that this morning, Lord, and I pray that through your word you will sanctify us once more. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in verses 1 to 7, James argued that favoritism towards the rich at the cost of poor people is not right. Discrimination against people, especially in the church, is wrong. And in those first few verses, he pointed to two reasons why that is wrong. One, it contradicts God's attitude towards the poor. He loves them, he saves them, he makes them rich in his kingdom. And secondly, it, it doesn't make sense, simply. Um, they are glorifying people, rolling out the red carpet for people who do not deserve it, people who exploit them, people who drag them into courts, people who blaspheme the name of the Lord Jesus that they love. But his third argument against such discrimination is the most important one. Discrimination or partiality violates the command of God to love one another. Let's go to verse 8 again. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. The banner that we can fly over this verse um, is this. The right thing to do as a believer is to keep the law of loving your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still struggling from a, a bout of laryngitis, so my voice is, is not what it should be, and every now and then I might take a sip of water just to soothe it. When the writers in the Bible refer to the law, it's almost always a reference to the law of Moses, the written law, or as James puts it, the law found in Scripture. But why did James call it the royal law here in verse 8? Now the word royal can also be translated as supreme or governing. So in that sense, this law of loving one another is the, the governing law, the supreme law on which all the other hangs. It's, it's like the hanger on which all the other hangs uh, hang. But there's another shade to the understanding of this word royal in the original Greek that we should take note of. In the original Greek, that word royal means belonging to the king. Meaning that the law that we have in scripture is our king's law. And in, in those days you obeyed the law of the king. It is our God's will for us in how to live, and in this case, how to relate to one another. What is that law that comes from our king, that is the, the governing principle, the supreme law, the hanger on which the other hang? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Conf conforming to the law of God takes place in accordance with conformity to that central demand of the law, which is love. Love for God and love for one another or love for your neighbor as God puts it in his word. And that love command stands at the heart of the whole law. It is governing the law, so to speak, of the king. It is the hanger on which the other hang. Let me explain it this way. If you love God, will you have other gods before him? No. If you love God, you will not make idols and worship them, won't you? If you love God, you will not misuse his name, will you? If you love God, you will keep his day of rest. It, and if you love other people, would you lie to them? Would you dishonor your parents? Would you commit adultery? Would you steal from them? Would you covet what they have? No. Can you see that 
the hanger on, on which all these commands hang is love for God and love for one another, loving your neighbor. That's how God wants us to relate to each other, especially in the church, but also to other people. Listen to Jesus in this regard. That the, the love for God and love for one another are the two hangers on which the whole law hangs. There was an expert of the law who came to the Lord Jesus on one occasion and asked him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, that was a much debated question among the rabbis and the experts of the law in those days. But Christ answered him, coming directly from the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. There's the one hanger. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. In other words, of equal importance, love your neighbor as yourself. There's the second hanger. But listen to his next words. All the law and the prophets hang. That's where I get the word hanger from. Hang on these two commandments. You can find that incident in Matthew 22 verses 37 to 40. These two are the hangers on which we hang the rest of the commandments. They hold them in place, so to speak. Go wrong there and you go wrong with the rest. But now we've been talking about other people. We've been referring to them as neighbors. The Bible definitely refers to them as neighbors that we should love as ourselves. A very logical question then is, well, who are they? Who are our neighbors whom we should love? Well, the short answer is this. Everyone you come in contact with. Even your enemies. You can read that up for yourself for yourselves in Luke 10, verse 25 to 37. Your neighbor is the person that God, in his providence, brings over or into your life in one way or another. It can be your family members, or definitely is your family members, it's your, ch your church members, your church family can even be the person helping you at the counter, the one dressing your hair, um, even your enemies, as I've said. Some of them might be rich, some of them might be sick, some of them might have a different religion, um, some of them might be very difficult to show love to. They are all the people that God brings in your life, crossing your life's path. They are what we would call your neighbor in your life. And the way God wants us to show that we belong to his kingdom, that we are being governed by his royal law, is that you love them without discriminating against who they are of what they have, but love them as you love yourself. That's the qualification of the kind of love that we should show to others in God's kingdom and to others outside of his kingdom. That is the standard of the kind of love we need to display in our relations. I am to love others as I love myself. How does that look? When I love my neighbor as myself, it means that his concerns become as important as my own. His needs as important as my own. His losses and crosses as important as mine. I respect him because I want to be respected. I treat him with dignity and with fairness, without discrimination, because I want to be treated without fairness, uh, with fairness and with dignity. The kind of love that, that we show our neighbor is the kind of love where we are patient towards that, towards the neighbor, as we expect patience with us kind to them as we expect kindness to us, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no records of wrong. This is the kind of love that we display then to those who the Bible qualifies as our neighbor. What I've just read to you is simply a list that we find in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 to 7. This is love. 
This is the supreme law of the king of kings of, for how people in his kingdom should relate to others and to one another. The banner which we can fly over verse 9 is this. By showing favoritism, we disobey God's royal law of love. Let's read verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. Favoritism, partiality, violates this hanger called love from which the law of the king hangs. Discrimination violates God's command to love our neighbor, which is why if we are guilty of favoritism, we sin. We are lawbreakers. In the Greek, it literally reads something like this. We, work, we are working sin if we do that. Now, all people deserve the same respect, deserve the same attention, especially when they enter our churches, irrespective of how well they are dressed or not, irrespective of whether they are dressed in, in rags or whether they come into our church with the finest of suits. We treat them just the same. In Christ, we know by now there's, there's neither poor nor rich, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor, nor master, or fe male nor female. There is an equality, and we treat people with that kind of fairness. We treat them all the same, with an unconditional love. There are no, there's no favoritism and no discrimination in a Christian's life, or there should not be, at least. When we belong to Jesus, we are in his kingdom. And his kingdom does not have the same rules as the kingdom of this world, who teaches that we can step on one another to reach the top, that we can destroy other people to be the best. No, in, in God's kingdom, the values are a bit different, actually radically different. And that this is the one that governs them all. We unconditionally love all people who cross our paths. We love them as we love ourselves. If we discriminate against people, if we are partial against people in, in the expression of our love to them, we break this law of the kingdom. But, now as, as a Jew, James must have anticipated some kind of objection to this or rationalization for their actions. You listen, you know, James, this is a minor thing. It is not as if we have now become serial killers, you know. We haven't murdered anybody, James. Why do you come down so hard on us? James responds. Let's read verses 10 and 11. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a law breaker. The banner we can fly over these two verses is something like this. There are no light or heavy laws. If you break one, you've broken the whole law. James's response, anticipated response, might have been something like this. You know, you, you, you might see this as something insignificant, but let me tell you, if you have broken just one command of God, you have broken all of it. Jesus himself taught in Matthew 5, verse 18 to 19, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because all the laws come from the same law giver. And trespassing them or breaking them then is sin against this one law giver, which is God. Whether you've committed adultery or murder, you are a lawbreaker. Break one command and you've broken the whole law. One theologian that wrote um, quite a good commentary on this letter of James, Alec Motier, um, had the following, has the following explanation for this principle, and, and I'm going to quote him, quote, 
the law of God is not like a heap of stones, but rather like a sheet of glass. We could take away one stone from the heap and leave, leave the heap itself intact. But when we throw a stone through a window, it strikes one place, but it fragments the whole. The law of God is like the glass. A break at any one point cannot be contained. The cracking and grazing spreads over the entire area. End of quote. Which means that there are no such thing as minor and major laws when it comes to God. Now, this was very significant for the people James wrote this letter to because some rabbis in his day held that, that if a law that was counted as prime importance, as, as important as what they would call a heavy law, was kept and observed, it would cover some other lighter laws. Um, less respect is needed for lighter ones. For example, honoring your parents, observing the Sabbath, and not to kill, these were heavy laws. But showing partiality, uh, well, that's kind of a minor infringement, and, and it was seen as an excusable breach. And it seems as if this kind of thinking spilled over from the experts of the laws and the rabbis that these people were exposed to in their earlier days. James absolutely demolished that idea here. Any breach of the royal law is an offense to God and makes you a lawbreaker. Remember, the law of God is an expression of the, of the perfect righteous character of God. Break one law and you have tarnished the righteous character of God himself. It doesn't matter which one you break. So, with that in mind, the believer must live as one who will be judged by this law. The banner we are going to fly over verse 12 and the first part of verse 13 is this. Let the law of freedom determine your conduct. Now let's read those one and a half verse quickly. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. James identified the law according to which we will be judged and according to which we should speak and act as the law that gives the law that gives freedom here. I think it sounds, very, it sounds very contradictory in our world, doesn't it? Because we normally, our world normally sees laws as very restrictive, as taking away your freedom, your freedom to sin, that is actually in the end what they mean. So how can keeping a law give, how can that give freedom? But what does freedom now has to do with the law. What is this law that gives freedom that should determine our conduct and according to which we will be judged? Now, James already mentioned the royal law, remember the in verse 8, which is an expression of the will of our king according to which we should live with regard to one another. But he also pointed out that that law demands we love our neighbor. That should be the regulating principle on which all the other hang. We love our neighbors as ourselves. It's the foundation for our relations with one another and other people. But according to that law, we will always be found guilty. Because has anyone kept it perfectly? Any human being? We will always miss the mark. We will always fall short of God's standard, always stand guilty and condemned before God because we will not be able, we are not able to keep it perfectly. And God's standard is perfection. So how can we be saved? How can we be set free from its penalty? In our own strength, we cannot. We cannot work up a kind of a credit with God so that we can be, the, be righteous in his eyes and be perfect in his eyes. Which means that the law or keeping that law as a means to have a right standing with God cannot give freedom. 
In fact, it leaves us in bondage because we continually break it. But, and here's a good one. Good news. Christ fulfilled and kept, kept that law perfectly. He satisfied God's standard 100% for me and for you. So if we are in Christ, we are set free from the bondage of that law as well as its penalty because it was fulfilled in Christ himself and we are now in him. His perfect life is now reckoned to us by faith in him. He suffered and paid the penalty for our trespassing of God's law by dying on the cross in our place. That payment and that perfect life is reckoned to us through faith in him. So that when God the Father now looks at us, he sees us as we are in Christ. He sees a perfect life and a complete payment of the penalty for trespassing his royal law. In Christ, it is a law that gives freedom. Now, how will you feel about his law, his royal law? Now, I can tell you this, you will want to keep it with all your heart and mind and soul, won't you? Out of love for the one who set you free, who redeemed you, the one who saved you. You will freely and joyfully obey this law because in Christ you have been set free from the guilt and condemnation of that law. It is now a law that gives freedom to keep it without that baggage and that sword hang hanging over your head. You will now keep that law with, with so much more hope and confidence because in Christ it was kept perfectly and you will keep it with so much more spiritual gusto, not as a work to accomplish something with God, why? Because you were redeemed by Christ. You will keep it as a result of his sacrificed and perfect life that's yours through faith in him. When, when that is a reality for you, now you will want to love your neighbor because Christ loved you first. Now you will want to show mercy because you have been showed the ultimate mercy in Christ now you will not love conditionally. You will not be partial because you have been saved by Christ's unconditional love. Can you see how freedom is connected with the law here? But do you also see the underlying seriousness of this? The weightiness now of breaking this law. Because what does it now say about you if you do not love your neighbor as yourself? What does it say about your faith now if you show conditional love or if you discriminate against people? It says that you are not displaying the love of Christ, doesn't it? The one who saved you and set you free. That you are nullifying the footing from which you claim you keep the law, which is salvation and freedom in Christ. Your actions these ones of discriminating, these ones of showing favoritism, your actions are destroying the very mercy claim by which you were saved. Maybe you are not truly Christ's. Do you see the seriousness now? If this is what you do with his mercy, in other words, manifested in, in, in you not willfully obeying his law of loving, loving your neighbor as you love yourself, which is the, the law that, that James focuses on. Judgment without mercy will be shown to you. Judgment without mercy will be shown to those who practice the mercy, who do not practice the mercy they claim they have in Christ. Their lack of mercy deeds in this case disprove their love for Christ, disprove their faith for Christ, Disprove their salvation. Proves that they have not really been set free from the law by faith in Christ. So they will be personally, they will personally be judged by it and held accountable for their deeds and personally will pay the penalty for breaking God's law. 
Can you see the seriousness of having this freedom in Christ? This weightiness of now obeying His commands out of love? Love for Him? So, my dear brother and sister, act and speak according to the one who purchased your freedom with his life and death. And we find his will revealed in his word. And we find even his example that we can follow and imitate in his word. Show the mercy you have been shown in Christ if you are his. That is to other people. That's the only mercy that triumphs over judgment. And that brings us to that last sentence in verse 13. The banner is simply this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Verse 13, the last sentence, is exactly that. Those words, mercy triumphs over judgment. The mercy we show, others show our desire to love and keep the law of God. That's what we've been establishing so far. That's the seriousness and the weightiness of this law that gives freedom for the believer. But indirectly, it shows a heart made righteous by our merciful God, doesn't it? Something that we've established as well. Which is why practicing unconditional love, being dis discrimination, discriminating against people, um, showing partiality against people, is evidence of maybe not belonging to Christ, or if you do that, it is one of, the, one of the evidences that you really have experienced his ultimate mercy in salvation through faith. So once saved by and safe in Christ, we will practice the mercy we have experienced in and through him. For the believer, mercy had triumphed over judgment in Christ. Now the, the way James puts it here relates to the people who were reading this letter. In other words, we can also say, now go and do the same. Let mercy triumph over judgment in your life and in the way you treat and relate to other people. Show mercy to them, not judgment. Accept everyone who passes your path in Christ in unconditional love by not showing favoritism or partiality. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because in Christ, that is what we have experienced. He loved us even before we made this world. And he died for us so that we can have a right standing with God. So that we can l truly love God. And one of the ways we express this love for our God is by loving others as we love ourselves. May the Lord really bless you and keep you this weekend and this week, this upcoming week, and protect you. Um, we are praying for you. For now, let's do that, exactly that. Let's close our eyes and pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, that we've been once more reminded how important it is for believers, those who are saved by Christ, to show their love for you by keeping your Sabbath day, by not making idols, by not misusing your name, but also show their love for you by loving others as we love ourselves. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to continually keep that law, that hanger on which so many other um, laws hang, to keep that in our lives and keep it burning when we relate to other people. Let them see Christ when we relate to them. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.